Hi, this is Heidi Gaiman from ilovemyshepherd.com with video number seven for our Think on These study. Today we're going to talk about whatever is excellent. Um, first, we're going to define it. That's always very important to get on the same page. And then we're going to talk about how God is excellent and how he is the master, you know, of all things excellent. And then we'll talk about how that works in our lives, where we see that in our lives uh, and in his word and what he offers us. And then we'll also talk about how that works in us and we proclaim his excellence and what that kind of looks like in some unexpected ways, I think, uh, according to his word. So first, I want you to think about for just a second, what do people associate with the word excellence? What comes to mind when you think of excellence? I think I've asked you to do it before. You can, if you're in a group, you can stop the video and talk about that for just a second before we give it all away. Um, or you can keep going and just kind of think and jot some notes in your paper for later. But what do you think of when you think of the word excellent? Some of the things that I wrote down include goals. I often think of someone who can really set some goals and reach for the top, right? Top notch work is something else I wrote down. Just the very best of what is being done, whatever it is, whether it's like an athletic performance or academics or, um, goodness, uh, maybe a performance of some kind. Actually, excellence, I think, in our culture is kind of associated with performance. We don't always like associate it with, with motherhood. Oh, you could, but I don't think that's something that you normally hear someone talk about being excellent at keeping your house clean <laughs> or making sure children stay alive, things like that. Uh, but we think of excellent schools and put a blue ribbon on it, right? How about uh, expected behavior? Sometimes I think excellence comes with expectations. So you are excellent when you you meet the standard and go above it. Uh, there's a behavior associated with it. And all those things I said, like I said, kind of are associated with action or performance or something we do. And as always, God's word takes things in a very different direction because while God is concerned about what we do, his primary uh, value is in what he does for us and how he sends his son for us and how that excellence is played out through him and not us, right? Chief of sinners, though I be, Christ Jesus shed his blood for me. So let's define it first. Let's define it and get on the same page. So there's uh, some more information and a link in the viewer notes if you'd like to check out more. But I'll start with some basics. The really interesting thing about the Greek term, which is arete, arete, uh, is that it is intimately associated with moral excellence. So there's an aspect of morality to this excellence that we're talking about. Uh, there's virtue is um, another translation, perfection, good, and upright or righteousness is associated with it. So when you hear those things, you kind of start to think about, well, that's a little different than what we just talked about culturally when we think of excellent. Uh, there's certainly behavior involved in righteousness and things and a perfect uh, behavior you could associate with those things. But very rarely are we concerned with uh, perfect morality. That's not our, although there is a fair amount of, even though we don't like to admit it, judgmentalism toward whether you're living morally or not, depending on the the areas you live in and how people define what is moral and what is right. It leaves us in a conundrum of tension, if you will, where we feel the pressure of moral expectation and judgment, but there's no stated norm. There's no thing that is right um, that we need to fulfill. And then, of course, every time, no matter what it is, we're not going to be able to do it. We're, we're going to be imperfect when excellent in the Greek is associated with perfection. So the beautiful thing is that it causes us to turn. And remember Lovely from a, a video a couple times ago, we're going to turn toward God. We're going to 
look to him for perfection. And so that's the first section of our video today is we have an excellent God. He surely is excellent. Let's look at what um, some some ways to kind of define this throughout scripture. I love to look so we can hear scripture interpreting scripture from Old Testament, New Testament, gospels and epistles. So we're gonna step in different places today. So first, Deuteronomy 32 verse four. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. And this is a cool passage from Moses uh, when he is handing over the leadership reins to Joshua to go into the promised land. So Deuteronomy 32, verse, we'll read 3 and 4. It says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. So God is perfect, the rock, and I love it's like capitalized in my Bible, the rock. When I think of the rock, I think of um, the Tooth Fairy movie guy. What's his name? Is it Dwayne Johnson? I don't even know if that's his name. We'll have to Google it, right? But I think of the rock. And think of that then as the creator of the universe, uh, not the actor guy, but the fact that he is that like solid solid structure, solid man, solid spirit, solid everything that we can rely on, that we stand on, that foundation. It's really comforting, I think, to think of just this very solidness of God in his perfection. So he's unchanging. It doesn't uh, change and shift like the wind, like our other relationships do and things in this world and opinions and things like that. So God is perfect both in his justice, it says, for all his ways are justice, which is important. We went over that in a different video, but also his love. Uh, he is both perfect love and perfect justice. And so often those things, uh, let's say perfect justice and perfect grace even, so often those things feel like they are um, not in congruence, like they're either one's up or one's down. And instead, God has the the perfection of those things put together, both justice and grace. And that that is like very solid for us. We can turn to that truth. So he, his work is perfect. That's one way we know God is excellent. His, his work, what he does for us, what he does in his work as creator, as savior, and also as spirit in the Trinity. Okay, let's look at uh, Psalm 18, verse 30, this this passage is pretty cool because it's actually found in three places in Scripture, which is pretty different when you find the exact same psalmody in different places. It's also in Proverbs 30, verse 5, and it can also be found in 2 Samuel. Proverbs, or Psalm 18, verse 30. This God, I love it, this God. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. So first we had the rock, and now we have the shield. It's a really cool combination. We have both our foundation, and then we have something that stands between us and the dangers in the world and the dangers that we encounter with Satan and sin and all of his dominions and things like that. This God, his way is perfect. So his work was perfect, but also his way, which I think is more associated with his thoughts, with the way he does things, kind of how he is, who he is more than what he does. He, All of that is perfect also. And it's associated with the word. And remember, Jesus Christ in John 1 is the word made flesh. Uh, but the written word, too, is proves true. That we need to be reminded of constantly and proclaim constantly that he, his word is true. When we don't know what is morally excellent, we don't know what the right way is, we just turn to his word and find it and also find grace for our failure and grace for when it, the world looks so broken and ugly uh, and not so excellent. God is true. This God, it says. So he is our shield. Sometimes we need a shield from other people's uh, morality. We need a shield. Uh, maybe some of you have experienced abuse or have a, a friend or family member who has uh, 
maybe you have been sexually assaulted or maybe someone else's iniquity has been put on you they have uh, taken advantage of you in some way i think that's a really difficult thing when we confess our own sins but then there's these sins that are a result of other people's decisions and actions that come into our life and that can be a really painful thing you're you're not sure how to deal with it do you confess the sin uh when it is someone else's i think that the answer the short answer is yes because we can be clean cl cleaned we can be cleansed of whatever sin that is whether it uh is from our own ignorance our own uh, lust and our own idolatry i guess you could use all these fancy words but we also do experience the consequences of just sin in the world around us in our communities and in our world and our lives and our families and then also the sin uh, directly placed on us from maybe a broken marriage or just very difficult things that we encounter and this shield can be really important to know that god he stands between us and other people's junk <laughs> we want to be able to be in life together with people that's really important we don't want to shut ourselves off satan loves isolation but we do have a shield god protects us and he also stands in that gap when things have happened to us that he uh helps us to set boundaries for the future and then also that shield i think just so often is his love and his grace and his absolution for whatever sin it is uh yours mine and ours and all the other things that he is that shield that that forgiveness lives in and out of us uh, and around us through christ jesus no matter what befalls us all right let's go on to isaiah 25 we're getting our getting our old testament on right now Isaiah 25, verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Wonderful things. I think things, things that are full of wonder. Things that are a supernatural. And I would say that we could certainly classify that then as excellent. Out of above and beyond the top notch we could ever set in this world is the way God works. He doesn't have to work within our bounds and our means. Uh, but these are associated with his plans. And that is just really touching to me, the fact that God's plans are excellent. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Uh, those plans are excellent plans. Even when they don't maybe look excellent to us at the time. And maybe when we need to remember that God has that eternal perspective. They are eternally excellent. Maybe not feeling momentarily excellent and that's really hard it, it doesn't make it any easier sometimes when you can't see the plans but just being reminded of the truth that they are excellent that he has some plans and some future and it is excellent for you and for me and for his kingdom the community of god so we have this excellent god um another way that you can see it in the new testament is pretty uh, unique. Let's look at Colossians 1, 15 through 19. Colossians 1, 15 through 19. And maybe your Bible has the subheading right above these verses, the preeminence of Christ, preeminence of Christ. And let's read about that. I think this is very much associated with his excellence. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. I'm going to stop there. I read a little far, but that I think 
kind of sums up God's excellent in this giant preeminent being that God is God and we are not. And he is uh, in charge. He has this authority. So God's authority is excellent in our lives. He has control, whether we like it or not. Um, and when we submit to that control, when we recognize that control, uh, just the, the relationship that comes from it is so helpful. It's, it is associated with that rock that we have. We can rely on it and rest in the rock when we recognize his authority for the plans in our life. And then also just like he was there in the beginning. He was there before the earth was formed. He had these plans long ago and he'll be there at the end and beyond. He has a plan for the new creation and all of that is excellent. This passage really reminds me, and I'm sure a lot of the Nicene Creed was developed off of some of the things in here. It talks about he's visible and invisible. And so when we say the Nicene Creed, we say God of God, light of light, very God of very God. What does that even mean? We should look it up as a, as a group or an individual studying, right? Google it. Uh, look it up in your uh, hymnal or ask your pastor. These are some cool things to root out in some traditions, some routine things that we do to confess our faith. It is excellent, my friends, to confess it together, though, to say he is God of God and light of light. And what does that mean then for our lives? And uh, we talked about the word already. We talked about him being our foundation. But here I think we see that he is the authority. And we often think of Christ as our savior, which is most certainly true that he suffered and died for us, that he loves us individually as well as communally. But let us also not forget that he is an excellent God. He's divine as well. He, His human nature and his divine nature exist co-eternally. It's just this beautiful, complex theological thing. But we also, it's important, I think, that we recognize morality and perfection associated with all persons of the Trinity. And that's because we often can easily miss the excellent work of the Spirit in us, of the excellent work of Christ dying on the cross and rising again, and then ascending into heaven and sending us the Holy Spirit to do that work in us, to, to live out and shine through us. And so, we then are designed for that spirit to live in excellence. We are we are never going to be excellent on our own. We might do some excellent things, but we rely on an excellent spirit in us to live and to work. And let's see a little bit of how he does that in the next section we have here. Um, 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. Here it is. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people from his own possession. Remember, all that thing kind all of those things kind of fall back on that authority of who God is in our lives. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light into his marvelous light. That light always makes me think of the resurrection. There's a song, one of my favorite songs by Ellie Holcomb uh, called Marvelous Light and about how God just calls us out of that darkness that is the tomb, uh, that he, he did lift his sins on us, but they didn't stay. They, uh, he was buried, but he rose again. And that takes shame out of the picture. Because we have Christ in our lives, because he is our savior and he can walk out into the light, that is what we proclaim. Yes, we proclaim the cross of Christ crucified, but we cannot stop there. We proclaim his light. His light is marvelous. It is excellent. So let us show that to our neighbors around us. And that's the spirit's work. Like we'll never do it on our own, but the spirit works in us and through us and in our, our lives to say, look, this is the savior of the world. Isn't he excellent? Look at what he is doing in her life and in her life and in her life. 
So I think that this is easily thought then of doing the big things are excellent. Doing uh, a holy ministry is excellent. Or uh, doing something great and grand and uh, writing an amazing dissertation is excellent. But I would propose that God is so interesting that if you look again and again in scripture, he uses the ordinary to show his excellency. He uses the supernatural and we get to see that in miracles and uh, a God come down to us on earth. But we also see him very much use the ordinary, the ordinary. I think it is most helpful to look at a passage that again uses the, the word for excellent in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. This passage will probably sound really familiar to most of you, but hopefully in a new application of it. How does God work his excellence and his light shining in our lives through the ordinary? Let's see. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, and we're going to read to 13, verse 3. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do you work? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you still a more excellent way. So there's all these things we could do in the body of Christ, all of them, and they're all very meaningful and excellent. But there is a more excellent way. What is it? If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, if I understand and know everything about God and his word and the church and all that good theological jargon, and if I have all faith, if I am just like a prayer meister, I can pray it up and I am just full of faith and proclaiming it, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I am just the most amazing steward known to man, if I am just generously giving and inviting people in and hospitable and sharing and caring of myself, my time, my talents, my treasures, all of it. If I deliver up my body to be burned as a martyr, right? If I give up my life for this faith, but have not love, I gain nothing. God works in love. God tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. God works through love. That is the more excellent way that he works. We have all these ways he works, and we just went over a lot of them. He's our rock. He's the word. He does these things. He's resurrected. But love is God's primary language, and that is the most excellent way, is when we share love in truth with our friends, with our neighbors, and with ourselves. When we read his word and remember that we are part of it, that we're part of that story that he is writing. And so there's this tension between the extraordinary, the God that's big and amazing and excellent in that way, but also the God that's excellent in very ordinary ways. As a man come to this earth to die for us, to rise again, and then a spirit that lives in us that does very ordinary things. We don't always see it like, whoa, flashing lights. Here's God at work. Here is excellence. But let us look for excellence in the way he's working in the small ways that we love our families. We love our neighbor. We love when it's hard. Uh, we love loud and we love soft and we love hard sometimes. Let us be filled with love. Let's look back to conclude at Deuteronomy 31 again. So the very first passage we looked at was Deuteronomy 32. And right before it, it tells us uh, in Deuteronomy 31 what Moses was doing. So Deuteronomy 32, where we talked about God's the rock and his work is perfect. 
it's cool to hear Moses, uh, just the, the contextualization of, the, of what Moses is going to do. So it goes on for like at least a whole chapter. Yeah, 32 is just this huge chapter. And then Moses like also goes on in 33. So there's just plenty to proclaim the excellencies of him, right? That first Peter said. But Moses says in Deuteronomy 31 verse 30, then Moses spoke the words of the song until they were finished. And isn't that true for our own lives too? I love it. In the ears of all the assembly of Israel. But he spoke the words of the song until they were finished. Just just let God speak through you. Let God's spirit speak until he's finished. He has a plan. It is excellent. He has a savior and forgiveness for you and it is excellent. And just let him work until he's finished. Uh, and he, he knows, he's the authority, right? He knows when he's finished and he is not done with you yet. He's got some stuff for you to do. And I am thankful that you have invited me in to be a little bit a part of teaching and learning and growing together. All right, we have our last video coming up next. So look for the last one on worthy of praise, worthy of praise. And I can tell you that it will be a joyful video, I think. So I'll see you next time.